Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zara. With me, as always, is professional film critic, Sean Patrick. Visit us at IHateCritics.net, Everyone's a Critic Podcast.com, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Our handle is CriticsPod. Uh, follow us on those platforms. We're also on YouTube, Alexa, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, all your podcatchers. Subscribe to the show, write and review the show. Uh, click on the notifications button, the little bell at YouTube to know when a new episode drops. Uh, anything you can do to help us with the algorithms. There's a lot of movie review podcasts out there. And then Patreon, patreon.com slash critics pod. Best way to help support the podcast, get yourself a credit on the show. And then there's our T public page at I hate critics.net up on the right hand corner. You can click on that to buy any of our merch. Uh, part of it designed by our, uh, cousin Jeff. He also has his own T public page as well. Uh, and Jeff Lasseter, I don't, again, I got to look that up and just link to it somewhere someday because <laughs> he's got some good <laughs> stuff on there. Uh, <clears throat> I did make it, I didn't go to the theater, but I went to the drive in this weekend. Uh, yeah. And I haven't been to the drive-in in a long time, and we went and saw E.T. and Back to the Future, and part of it was just like, why can't we leave the kids at home and go see some... I mean, one, they don't exist, but there should be, like, grindhouse-type movies and these <laughs> things, not family-friendly movies. I mean, The Hunt was playing at another screen nearby, yeah. uh, but... Still, I mean, E.T. and Back to the Future are classics. I'm not, gonna, I'm not complaining by any means. We get there. We're like the third car there. My son and I start going playing catch, and all of a sudden, this cop car pulls in with his lights on. Then a fire truck pulls in with its lights on, and then, or an ambulance and a fire truck. And they're all huddled around this car. And what had happened, <laughs> this is the dumbest thing. I mean, I'm sure there's dumber things, but it's pretty fucking dumb. This girl was trying to climb onto the back of a pickup truck and fell and rolled her ankle. They called 911, which sent three different, you know, a cop uh, ambulance and the firefighters over to the drive-in uh, to look on this at this rolled ankle. Who They didn't take her away, did nothing. They just, I mean, granted, the movie just hadn't started yet, so it was it right. didn't totally interrupt, but it was just kind of like, what the hell are you calling 911 for for a rolled ankle? I thought maybe the theater oh, brought somebody out because they hurt themselves, but no, the people called 911 themselves. Uh, it was pretty. Wow. Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> what the hell? Who the hell thinks you know what I'd like to pay everyone for a rolled ankle? <laughs> yeah, I mean. Like I said, I was away playing catch with my son because we were kind of trying, trying to stay away from the cars. Uh, yeah. It, it's possible, you know, sometimes when you get hurt right away, you overreact. But, geez, you know, give it – anytime something happens, you really got to give yourself the chance to panic, calm down, and then <laughs> address the situation. <laughs> I mean, it's not like those bones sticking out of her ankle or anything like that. Maybe they thought it was broken. <laughs> Even then, do you call 911 or do you just throw in the back of the truck and drive to the hospital? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's not what I do because I'm not willing to pay $700 for that ride. No. I was, like, near, I was once near death and drove myself to the hospital just because I didn't want to pay. <laughs> no, I, like I was having a severe asthma attack. It was dangerous for me to be driving. I'm like, you know, I don't have a fair $700 right now. I'm just going to try and take the risk. Uh, and I'm with you. I've done. I've had. Uh, well, I thought I was having a heart attack once, and it was it ended up being like severe heartburn or acid reflux or something really bad. But it was basically the way you hear people talk about with their heart attacks. What was happening was happening to me. So I got scared. I went to the emergency room. They couldn't. They made me sit and wait in the waiting room. And I was just like, I mean, I couldn't, I was in so much pain. I couldn't hardly breathe. I couldn't catch my breath. I got up and I drove to the walk-in clinic and then they told me they can't do anything for me. I need to go back to the emergency room. And I was like, well, they weren't taking care of me there. And it was starting to really get nervous. And so then, uh, they told me to go to another emergency room and they wanted to send an ambulance to take me there. I'm like, no, I got it. And they fought me and I'm like, no, just, I'm going to get there. I'll be fine. And I ended up driving there myself. <laughs> but no, I'm with you. I'm a cheapskate. If it's a waste of money, you shouldn't do it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if you absolutely are desperate, like there's no other option. 
Well, that is not a waste of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Generally speaking, for me to get in an ambulance, somebody else has to say, like somebody else will have to make. Right. When I saw E.T. and Back to the Future, uh, my kids, everybody had seen them, but my son ended up staying up the whole time. I fell asleep during Back to the Future. My wife and daughter fell asleep and never woke up. Uh, my son, who was on some sort of medication that made him drowsy, stayed up the entire time. <laughs> <clears throat> and at the end of Back to the Future, was jumping up and down inside of the, on the back of the truck, <laughs> just kind of wide awake and wired <laughs> at like midnight or one in the morning whenever the thing ended. Uh, and school starts Monday, so getting them back in routine is going to be great. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's get to the new movies this week, and we'll start with Netflix's Project Power. Oh, yes. Project Power stars Jamie Foxx and Joseph Gordon-Levitt uh, as uh, two disparate people who are going to be drawn together to battle drug dealers who have created a, a drug that can turn you into a super hero or give you superpowers, I guess, for like five minutes at a time. Or it can cause you to explode or or uh, catch uh, uh, like uh, t- turn into a frozen person who just falls to pieces or whatever. You know, it, it, it all depends. You kind of take in your risk, kind of like regular drugs. You know, it <laughs> went by us, does cocaine one time and then dies like so that kind of it's that kind of drug. So it's really it's a it's a metaphoric superhero drug like. I've heard a lot of people say that cocaine can make you feel like a superhero. It's just the kind of superhero who just won't shut up and <laughs> <laughs> thinks they're funny. Um, uh, no, I mean, uh, this is uh, this isn't bad. It's just not good, if yeah. I could say that. Uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt is the cop, and Jamie Lee Fox or Jamie Jamie Lee Fox. What? Uh, Jamie Fox is a. Uh, uh, <laughs> former soldier who who is uh, searching for his daughter who's been taken by the big drug people because she has like secret mutant superpowers, I guess. Uh, I don't know. This movie, like I said, is not bad. It's just not very good. And there's a lot of cliches. There's a lot of uh, obvious metaphor. Uh, Jamie Foxx has so much money. Like just just random amounts of money just everywhere. He's got as much money as he needs to do anything at any point to the point where he can finish the movie by giving other people like thousands upon thousands of dollars. Uh, Why? Fuck, I don't know. Uh, (laughs) They're trying out this new drug and they're only trying it out in New Orleans for some reason, uh, which really never really plays into anything important. Uh, aside from repeated references to the Saints, uh, J- you know, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character wears a Saints jersey the entire time, and people are talking about who dat, uh, who dat gonna beat them Saints all the time uh, for reasons uh, that that comes up a lot. Uh, the more I talk about it, the more I start to hate this movie because it's it's not it's actually not very good. Uh, <laughs> I don't I don't want to hate this, but I'm like the more I think about it, like what the hell even happened in this movie? Like even the violence wasn't particularly interesting. Uh, there's a lot of you know fight scenes. And I guess uh, there's a guy who's on fire, who's attacking Jamie Foxx, who does not seem the least bit phased by the fact that he's fighting a man who is currently on fire and is repeatedly catching him on fire and then boiling him, which I'm sorry, but Jamie Foxx beats this guy, but like, like trying to drown him while this guy's on fire and the water's just boiling the entire time. Like Jamie Foxx's hands would not survive this. And he comes out with just a burn on his arm. Like, no, that's not how, that's not how hot works. Um, <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's just stop there for a second. Cause that whole scene is him trying to beat a confession out of him or at least get information, which yeah. is what's so <laughs> stupid about it on top of all of that. <laughs> I mean, the guy's, he's trying to drown him in a bathtub while he's burning everything around him. Like you said, the water starts boiling. Would that actually happen or not? I don't know, but they show it boiling. So yeah. at some point, you just got to go with the movie. And I don't know. It, it just, yeah, go ahead. Continue on. And then he just explodes. Right. Uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt has like a superpower where he's bulletproof, but that he also has like super strength, I guess, or kind of. That's never very clear. Like the bulletproof thing, they make very clear because they show that in super slow mo, which is always just 
awesome super <laughs> slow mo. Uh, <laughs> it's probably the only way to really show it too. Uh, yeah, to make yeah. it effective. I don't know. I think you could just shoot the guy in the face and he like falls down. It's like, oh shit, he's dead. Well, you can no, do that, but it's neat to see the. I guess they think it's neat to see the bullet kind of crumble on his head. I guess, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's 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 all right. Like whatever. Right, it doesn't do anything uh, for the audience, but for the people making it, it's cool. And I guess like this uh, bulletproof thing is like the regular effect because like, another guy in the movie has that too. Excuse me, one second. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but there's like another guy, random dude, who just has that power as well. Uh, I don't know. Like both Jamie Jamie Foxx and, and Joseph Gordon-Levitt are really charismatic guys. The the young girl in the movie is a really talented uh, rapper, as far as I know. You know I'm not, not a big rap fan. Like I don't dislike it. I like some of it. Uh, but I don't, I don't, is she good? I, she seems like she's good at it. They tell us so she is, so yeah, <laughs> that works for me. <laughs> I'll take your word for it, movie. Uh, she's she's fine. She's interesting. I don't, you know, uh, but she's got a very typical backstory. Like she's only she's a good person who only sells this super power drug to people so she can pay for her mom's diabetes treatment. And it's like, why don't just give her the super drug? Maybe that'll take care of the. Maybe she'll become anti diabetes. I don't know. What's her superpower? You might find out. Or she might die. I don't know. That's how that works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, either way, you're finding out. So, <laughs> I mean, the problem for me with this movie is it's just trying to be overcomplicated. It, it, less is so much more here. I mean, like you said, Jamie Foxx and Joseph Gordon-Levitt are fine. Yeah. They're the only decent thing. I mean, some of the actors are the only decent things about the movie. Everything else is just... Like, they flirt with this thing as Jamie Foxx is a good guy or a bad guy, and they didn't need to. You throw that whole out, whole thing out of the movie, because then you just get confused. You don't know what the yeah. hell is going on. Uh, they don't really explain. Like you said, sometimes you blow up, sometimes you don't. I think based on what your personality traits are, how the drugs work with you, define what you're going to be. Like, I guess Jamie Foxx will never blow up here. He has a specific power. Joseph Gordon Lovett's never going to blow up. He's bulletproof. <laughs> but some people will. But they don't. I mean, you kind of have to figure well, that out for yourself. And there's also like this intimation that, like, if you do this a lot, it takes a toll on you. Like, one of the big bad guys, his skin has started to, like, come away from, from his body a little bit. Yeah. You can only kind of see it on his neck. But. And his power is like gigantism, so he like uh, can blow up into a giant, and you can see that that's kind of having a long term effect. And I think Jamie Foxx indicates that if he does his power again, that he might die doing it. Which his power, his po- these powers are derived from animals? Yeah. Question mark? Uh, maybe because I get I don't really know many bulletproof animals, but all right, uh, but. <laughs> Apparently, that's what Jamie Foxx says. That or some one of them says that this is these are derived from animals. But then one lady has like Elsa powers from Frozen for some reason. Right. Uh, but but Jamie Foxx's power is based off of this this actual shrimp that like uses really hot water, like or turning water hot as its like thing to keep predators away. And so it's like the pistol shrimp. Uh, Jimmy Jamie Foxx is a pistol shrimp. Okay. What is that? <laughs> is this common knowledge? Like we're all like I had to Google it. I, and I think anybody who's watching this is going to be like, hang on, let me Google pistol shrimp to see if this is a real thing. And it is. It's a real thing. But it's like, should your superpower be something everybody has to stop the movie for a minute to Google? Well, what, which nobody's going to do. Did you Google what animal bursts out in flames or, or freezes? <laughs> I did. OK, because I didn't I miss that one. Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, the movie's overcomplicated and it doesn't need to be. It's not it, it, it just a more straightforward story without trying to be, you know, cool and neat. I, I don't know. It, it just it, it would not, it could never be a great movie, but it could have been a fun little action movie if you just simplified it and yeah. quit trying to explain. You know, throw out the throw out the explanation. You don't need an explanation. Just make an action movie based on a super drug. Yeah. Uh, when you start wondering what the explanation, that's when people start questioning things and it doesn't work. But if you just make us go along for the ride, then maybe it'll be fun, especially if you got those actors. But instead, they just overcomplicate things. You don't, 
I mean, you kind of know what's going on because it is a simple idea in the grand scheme of things. They just try to, they try to make it all uh, twisty and and it just doesn't work. It's it comes back down to the actors being good enough to make it watchable. But like you said, the more you talk about it, the more you just like even someone who likes it's not going to go back and watch this. Right. So I, it, I, I it reminded me a lot of uh, a lot of Bright, which like yeah. there's a lot of ideas in Bright, but they're all bad. <laughs> and, and this movie it reminded me of that, of that a lot. It's like they, you know, they here we've given Jamie Fox one interesting trait, one interesting trait where he's kind of maybe the guy who might be the biggest bad in the movie and like the baddest fighter and like uh, and he doesn't even use the drug. Like it's okay. Like this is kind of interesting. Like I want to see Jamie Fox now be the bad guy versus. Levitt is the good guy, and then of course they turn that because of course no, he's just a crusading dad who's trying to get his daughter back. And it's like okay, fine, I've never seen that before. Right. Oh wait, yes, I have. Ever like fucking million times, <laughs> Commando, uh, <laughs> Ransom. Like, give me uh, any. I can come up with a dozen more where it's just like they're just trying to. The kid is a plot point. Uh, you know. Uh, fucking <laughs> child of children, children of men. Like it's all those movies are, are about children that have to be rescued or taken somewhere. Yeah. And <clears throat> you could have made a okay version of that movie if that's all you did. But again, <laughs> you're trying to do too much. You, you, you didn't, you couldn't make up your mind what movie you were making. And instead you just got, I mean, I guess Netflix is a good spot for it cause it can die a peaceful death and not hurt anybody. <laughs> Uh, I mean, no one's gonna walk away going, "This sucks ass." But you're gonna, <laughs> but you're gonna do what we're doing. You're gonna, no one, first of all, no one else is gonna talk about this but us. No, and but because yeah. we're talking about it, we're hating it more and more. <laughs> so this movie is just gonna be forgotten, and that's good for them. And that t- that title's not gonna help with that either, with the memorable factor, because no that title means absolute jack. I mean, I think the I think the pills are called power, I guess, but like, there's no project. Nobody's put together a project power. Uh, and even if they did, why are you naming your evil scheme? <laughs> like, yeah. who takes the time? Like, this is pr- welcome to Project Cocaine, Bob. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, when you sent me the name and then Jamie Foxx, I was kind of like, yeah. <laughs> really. Then I saw Joseph Gordon Levin. I was like, oh, he's usually a little bit choosier, pickier, or whatever. So maybe it'll be okay. And again, they're the only things that work. Uh, don't waste your time. I don't care. I you you're better off sitting in silence for two hours, really. Yeah, than watching absolutely. This. And like and Jordan, Joseph Gordon Levitt, like is barely in this movie. Like he's there, but he like barely does anything. Like one of his scenes is just walking around a boat, going, "Open this door." <laughs> okay, now open this door. Open this door. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and skip this one. Yeah. Uh, what about Sputnik? I ended up skipping this one because it just seemed like I I didn't I read your review and I watched the trailer and it looks good. I want to see it, but I just was never in the mood to really give it the time it needed. You know, it's, I, what I found interesting about this is that this is a movie that that is set during the Cold War in 1983 is the setting. Uh, this uh, these Russian cosmonauts are returning from space. They get uh, attacked by some sort of alien being and they are able to manage. They're able to get back to Earth, but one of them uh, is dead and the other one is badly injured. Uh, and neither one of them, one of the one who survives, uh, can't really remember exactly what it is that happens or he can, but he doesn't want to tell anybody. And he's being held at this uh, secret facility somewhere on the border of Afghanistan and Russia. Uh, the. Uh, so he's being held there by this really commanding uh, major guy who's really an interesting actor and really like the most interesting guy in the movie, but he's also the villain. So uh, he hires this this uh, neurologist, uh, this female neurologist, who's kind of known as the bad girl of neurology, who uh, she was doing it. She did some kind of experimental treatment that got her like she saved a life, but she also like broke all the rules to do it. So they they suspend her and. And uh, so this, the major goes and gets her like, I want you to do whatever you can to get get inside this guy's head and figure out what's going on with him so we can save his life. And, uh, you know, obviously he's got other motives, but 
she's really intrigued because this is a mystery and you know she's got to go to the secret facility and she's going to meet a cosmonaut which is all a big deal in russia and it would be here too if you're meeting an astronaut secretly who just came back from space that'd be kind of cool but uh so she goes there and she's going to treat him and naturally she's going to find out that there's a whole alien thing going on and i don't know if it's a spoiler to tell you or not exactly where this alien is um but basically, the guy falls asleep, and the alien kind of sneaks out of him, in the uh, out out of his body, and goes around and uh, like bites people's heads off, and then uh, sneaks back in and crawls back inside of him. And kind of like Exorcist pretty, Three, kind of, yeah, a lot <laughs> like that actually, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's not bad, I guess. But the thing about it is, is that they, they kind of lose a lot of the tension and and the and the purpose of setting the movie in the cold war. Cause like the cold war is not as much of a touchstone as it used to be. Like there are people now who are growing up who are, you know, in their early, you know, late teens, early twenties who are kind of the horror movie audience. And if you said cold war to them, they'll go, what? <laughs> like <laughs> they're, they're learning about it in school, but not really like the, in terms of the references or like the, the, the hidden stuff, like the really deeper stuff that took place in the Cold War, the way that Russia used to be portrayed as villains that the, in, in the way they used to be, uh, where, you know, like I know for like I know and you know from millions of different tropes that, you know, the Russians were known for killing anybody who stepped out of line or making people disappear. Like that was kind of a, a thing that the KGB did. Mm hmm. But that trope has changed now. You know, like modern Russian villains are more modern. They're like hackers and like uh, or Vladimir Putin. Like they're they're that's the more modern Russian villain that people are more familiar with. And I just don't think this movie is capable of explaining that and existing in that. And, and nor do they have the the intention of really kind of explaining it. And thus, that removes the tension that would be there for anybody who like like us kind of is aware of this. And like it would be tense if they were leading into it more. So why do you even set it in 1983? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I guess cause nobody goes to the moon anymore, but I don't know. It's, it's, it's not a bad movie. It's not badly made. The aliens good enough. I guess it's all right. Uh, the, the romance bit is very predictable. Uh, the gore isn't very spectacular at all. Uh, it's very middling. <laughs> oh, that's, that makes me feel better. Uh, is it a slow burn or is it? I mean, the trailer made it look like it took it took its time. Which it, I I like movies that do that, but you have to be in the movie a mood for a movie like that. Does it have a slow build to it or is it? Yeah, kinda. Yeah, uh, it does. It takes it. It's deliberate. Uh, even in scenes where like a guy gets his head bitten off, it's still kind of it's still kind of deliberate about it. Uh, yeah, it's. It's like I said, it's a middling, you know, middling movie. You don't expect like middle of the road uh, movies to make it even out of Russia to the U.S. So that was yeah. kind of interesting. Like usually they, they reserve that to, for movies that are really, really good that they know they can sell to people. And I guess they're now just importing any random horror movie, even if it's in Russian. Well, I feel better about skipping it now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I don't know how I feel about this one. Boys State. Boys State is arguably the one of the most incredible artistic achievements of this young century, and at the same time, the single most depressing thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, because this movie is basically the demonstration of of what we've wrought uh, in our politics. Uh, it's basically we ruined an entire generation of people with the way that we allow our politicians to operate in this day and age where we've changed, you know, the, the role of being a public service person, a uh, person who's, you know, in public service as a lawmaker, we've turned that into now a game where I'm going to win and you're going to lose. And I don't care what I have to do to do that. And, and now we, you know, we we're just kind of reinforcing that value over and over and over again, where it's all about winning and not even about, doing what's right anymore. And even the good people are the ones who are willing to compromise to do whatever it is to get the win. And man, is this disappointing. And yet at the same time, it's, it's, you know, an incredible work. I think this documentary is amazing. Uh, 
so they take the perspective of a couple different people. This is based off of a real thing. Boy State uh, is put on by the American Legion every year for kids in the 16 to 17 to 18 year old age range. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Is it in every state or just tech? I mean, I know it's not just in Texas, but. I believe it's in, I believe it's in most states. I'm not sure if it's in every state, but it's in most. Okay. Because there's an American Legion post everywhere. So Sorry. wherever there's American Legion posts, there are usually Boy State. Oh. Um, Sorry, you cut out there. Oh, I said, oh, interesting. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> uh, before anybody starts thinking this is a sexist thing, there's also a girls state where girls go through the exact same process. And you can decide how you feel about the separation of boys and girls in that uh, situation. But uh, the the Texas boys state was probably chosen for this specifically because they were in the headlines a couple of years ago because the leadership of boys state in I think it was 2017 decided that Texas should secede from the union. And and uh, that became kind of a, a thing where people were kind of taking note of this for the first time of what this boys state thing is. It was really snarky and just kind of, you know, Ben Shapiro y, and that's kind of what, what 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 that was about. And that element still exists in this in this time as well. Three years later, they're still talking about that uh, at Boys State. How you know how embarrassed many of them were by the fact that they allowed that to take place, which is the one good thing I think we see in this movie is that there are plenty of people who are at least embarrassed by that idea now. Uh, but there's this one kid, Stephen, who's like the hero of the movie who's this earnest genuine thoughtful kid who proves to be a very charismatic speaker when he when he gets an opportunity and he gives himself a chance and he's you know really becomes really you know very a very powerful speaker a very powerful centrist figure but even he not long after that is talking about you know the compromises that he's willing to make and granted you're gonna have to make compromises i understand that but there's an element to him by the end where even he seems to want to win this as much as anything else so at boy state you're you're divided up into nationalists and federalists so he puts you into two parties which again nobody ever talks about the indoctrination that's going on here into this two-party system because we keep telling people that you're going to be part of a two-party system no matter what you do and that type of nobody mentions indoctrination, but it's there. It's it's like the background, it like hovers over everything that these people do. But the nationalists and the federalists, the federalists, and Stephen is a nationalist. His opposite is this kid named Ben, who is just this dead-eyed monster golem who just uh, will do anything and compromise anything for victory, and he'll just use every nasty little trick in the book to win and he's like 17 and it just it's terrifying to watch this dead-eyed monster just go through the motions of being like Carl Rove crossed with uh, Steven Crowder like it's just awful it's horrifying to watch he 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 wanted to run for governor when he got there Ben and he realized very, very quickly that he's not particularly likable so he becomes the party chairman instead <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. again it's all just very dispiriting like if you're somebody who just is already worn out by politics this is not fun to to endure at the same time i do consider it to be an amazingly important work of art because it shows what we've done to an, an entire generation of people we've just destroyed any kind of idealism or thoughtfulness who just wiped that out in favor of this is the team I'm on and I'm going to win for my team, no matter what I have to do. And not to mention the other, there are other aspects too, that we've ingrained into people that are just ugly and nasty and wrong. And that, that all kind of comes out as well. And so, yeah, it's ugly and dispiriting and horrific and, and terrifying. And at the same time, it's a brilliant work of art. It, it depends, I guess, on your, your, your tolerance for politics, whether or not you're able to take it or not. Yeah. I, I, the only thing I'll disagree with you on is like the Steven Garza character. He is willing to compromise, but I don't think he's willing to compromise his beliefs. I think that's part of his beliefs is the ability to compromise. So I don't think he's compromising to win. I think he, that's part of what he truly believes in. But at the same time, I mean, that's it, it is what it is. But <clears throat> every review I've read has said there's hope for the future. After watching this movie, I'm like, where are you getting this hope from? Yeah. One, the <laughs> one good guy loses. <laughs> I mean, they make comments about, you know, yeah, he's ha he's able to have conversations with the people that disagree with him, and they come to a, 
you know, they come to a, an agreement and they start to understand each other. And I, I agree with there, but he still loses. So that's the minority. You know, yeah. the majority is still different. And it, it and there's absolutely no, there's enough Ben characters in this movie. I mean, Ben's the main one, but there's enough guys like him that it's there. It, it, it actually hurts my hope for the future and the fact that they're all <laughs> still involved in stuff. I mean, I would like to see I would love to see Steven stay involved with this and, and you know, keep being a public servant that's uh, he's the one guy i i don't think he's you know would be able to change much in terms of his beliefs but at the same time he's only one guy and he, nothing he can really do about it you know you got that rob character who's willing to say whatever you want him to say yeah you know he's act out there wa- acting like a macho douchebag i mean he runs <laughs> on the sides of his dick at one point <laughs> and gets second place, and he doesn't like. I mean, even they show him doing interviews off to the side. He's the one compromising his views the most. Oh yeah, and I mean, I, I don't know how likable he would have been anyway. But you know, it's it's interesting to hear him say what he truly believes and what he's out there doing. And I don't know. It, it, it's just it's more than anything. It's just like watching politics on slightly behind the scenes, I guess. But. Any more the twenty four hour news? There's no behind the scenes anymore. Really, you get to see everything. Yeah, and there's you're, there's nothing new here. It's more than anything just depressing. I, I just don't know where every review I'm reading keeps saying things just because of one character. That's not <laughs> enough for me to be like, yeah, there's hope for the future. <laughs> you know? No, we, we've I I truly feel strongly that this is actually like a disco- dystopian hellscape where we've just. We're unwilling to realize that we've destroyed an entire generation. And I think I think so many people have become so inured uh, to the way things are today that, you know, the, the lack of idealism, this this desire to see your side win and looking like I, I, I think if you're looking for hope in this or if you see hope in this, what you're really seeing is, oh, that guy could help win for my team. And that's not the way that you should see this. Right. It's like, you know, this constantly re- this constant reaffirming of the need to be on a team. And my team is this and my team wins this. And no, <laughs> we're supposed to be working. I, we're supposed to work together for the betterment of humanity. That's what we're supposed to do. And I know that's kind of I don't know if that's Pollyanna or what, but like uh, truly like we're supposed to care about each other and want to work together and want to do what's best for the world and and learn and grow and get better. And this this whole team mentality that we keep reinforcing and this idea that, well, I'm a Republican. I can I, I always have to be a Republican no matter what. I may not believe in what, you know. The president is doing, but he's he's a Republican president. What can I do? Not vote for him is you that something you can do, or you know disagree with him. Come up with a better idea. No, no, no. You don't understand. I'm a Republican. What does that mean? What? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Democrats do it too. Like oh, Democrats, yeah. there's a lot of Democrats who. I mean, Biden is pretty much an example of Democrats. Just like you know what? Let's we just need to win. Uh, we just need to win. <laughs> the idea of Biden is that. <laughs> <laughs> not just him the whole idea it's sad yeah. it's incredibly sad and that's really what boy state is just a reaffirmation of just how incredibly sad our current political situation is and if you see if you don't see that you don't see that we ruined an entire generation of young people with a uh, with the way we're acting uh it's just uh i i feel i it just makes it that much more dispiriting <laughs> Yeah, and it's beyond the politics of it. It's you know, it, I I really do blame like a lot of the twenty four hour news things where the opinion guys come on and because that's what you hear them arguing over. It's all I mean, you hear it at Thanksgiving, you hear it whenever you have in laws over, or at least I do. Uh, and but there is one scene in here that the closest thing to hope for me is, and it's kind of a it's not a throwaway scene, but it doesn't really move the plot forward at all. This character Renee. Who's another one I liked? Uh, they're trying to impeach him, and finally, at one point, he goes, "All right, let's vote to impeach." And like twelve guys stand up out of five hundred, <laughs> and that is, you know, you have this vocal douchebaggery thing going on in on social media in the world, on especially on the right side. But I mean, I'm sure it exists. I mean, it definitely exists on the left too. But it is such the minority of people. That that you know pointing that out 
was kind of cool. But again, it still doesn't give me hope because, again, the guy, you still have those Ben characters. And as right. long as that person exists, people are dumb enough to fall for it. I mean, he what he did to Renee was just terribly unethical. Cruel. Uh, and he, uh, straight up cruel. Multiple times, too. The very last thing he did, it made no sense at all. He was clearly in the wrong and tw- was able to twist it and essentially win because of that and you know steven and renee did the noble thing and that cost them the whole thing and i guess i still i that's where i go back to where do you see hope you know they do the right thing and they lose and i i mean granted these kids they're not a real government so it doesn't really matter but that's where we're at you know and you know, you can't do the right thing. And I don't know who who was the last person to do the right thing. Obama, maybe. I don't I mean, as far as we know, but even he, you could see the, all the hope <laughs> leave his face <laughs> two or three months after being president. Yeah. I mean, I, I used to as a kid when I was, you know, Stephen and Renee's age, I I was a big Bill Clinton fan. And I loved Bill Clinton. I loved everything that Bill Clinton did. And then, uh, you know, I grow up and I realize, oh, shit, Clinton fucked up so bad. Mm -hmm. He he was the one who passed the Telecommunications Act, which basically destroyed humanity. I mean, the current situation we're in right now with, you know, with so much of our modern politic is entirely linked to that awful telecommunications act which allowed so much media consolidation that you can't escape now this 24-hour news cycle you can't get other opinions it it basically destroyed so much of free speech and so much of actual you know conversation because now all the media is just consumed uh by like five people and i know there's you know podcasting obviously we're not controlled by anybody except for the corporations that use algorithms to not allow us to be to reach a wider audience but (laughs) right not that they're whole, there's no conspiracy to hold us back. I know that. Just well, I, I know saying. what you're saying, but I mean, right? There's no. It's very unlikely unless one of us becomes famous <laughs> right. that we're gonna be able to. And that's part. I mean, then that. I mean, that does exist. So yeah, I, I get there's a saying. there's this wonderful utopian universe out there where the Telecommunications Act never happened, and and like Fox News ever happened, and CNN never becomes what it is, and there aren't you know 10 million. Uh, news channels all spouting the same fucking shit. <laughs> there, there's like, uh, there are like dozens of channels and they all have different perspectives because they all have different owners and they all have, you know, uh, a more unique variation and the world is a different and better place. <laughs> yeah, did you ever watch that documentary about Hulk Hogan and Gawker or whatever? I don't think so. I don't oh, think I did. No. I mean, it, it's about that case where he got, he sued Gawker for whatever. Oh, my God. It was basically one guy funded Hulk Hogan and got Gawker shut down. I mean, they, he was able to shut down a, a media outlet through all this. And it, it was just really scary how it all – I mean, I really recommend it. It was, it was on Netflix for a while. I can't remember what it was called. Hulk Hogan is in the title. He's barely yeah. in it. He's at the very beginning. And they start with the trial, then they move on from him very quickly. But it yeah, is Peter, horrifying. Yeah, uh, Peter Thiel, who's also a character in the social media in the social network. Yeah, yeah, it's it just a horrifying when you really sit back and look at it. But no, this movie, while impressive, d- gives me no hope at all. I'm glad there's people that exist like Stephen and Renee. But I mean, I know I exist, and I know my intentions. I know you exist and your intentions and my other, you know, a lot of people. Right. And even on the other side, I know most people are decent human beings with, you know, the right intentions, but we can't stop arguing over headlines. <laughs> you know, yeah. even when we disagree, if you can get down to the meat of any issue, anybody could come to a realistic understanding or at least appreciating, like to me, the hardest one would be abortion because they're so, much involved on that side but at least you could get to the point where you understand both sides and (laughs) that is all you need out of that i don't know it's just frustrating and this movie does not give me any more hope for that for the future at all it's funny i I just had this memory of my brother when i was when i was when he was going to college he was a a philosophy major and this caused him to get into this thing where anytime he argued with me he would 
take he would argue with me to a point where he would try, try and find the point where he could where the argument just was so absurd that I couldn't continue to go forward no matter how logical my approach was he would find like the place in the argument where there's just no way forward like there's just no I don't know how he did it it was amazing but just kept asking me questions over and over again until he until he, I arrived at a point where I couldn't say yes or no anymore and I keep finding that that in this day and age, especially when it comes to like the COVID conversation, where finally it just comes down to there are a lot of people who are willing to let other people die just so they don't have to wear a mask. And how do you argue with that? <laughs> like, you where can. that is the that is like the end point of any conversation. You're willing to let people die just because you don't want to wear a mask because somebody told you to. I mean. <laughs> That's that's like the end point that you reach in an argument, and that's really where our modern politics have reached. Is this point where there are people who are there? there uh, somebody refers to you know people on the extreme right as a death cult, and yeah, they kind of are at that point. Yeah, it's yeah. I like I had family over, not over, but I was in an argument with my brother in law about stuff, and he kept bringing up. He brought back the hydroxychloroquine bullshit. I'm like, really? <laughs> I mean, what point are you? Where are you getting? He goes, it's not even because of Trump. They're just they're holding that company down because they want to make money over here. And I'm like, I understand your logic's not wrong. People want to make money, yeah. But you're wrong on this particular one. And then he just kept going on and on. And finally, I just had to be like, just because you're saying it doesn't make it true, you know? <laughs> At some point, I mean, I was even gonna bust my friend Corey's balls there was a study done by duke university and i read the study i didn't read the articles about the study i re- i mean i read those too but it got me to the study where they were saying like the neck masks are actually more harmful than not wearing a mask it doesn't really fucking matter because at this point no one wears a mask anyway other than like a few of us me you whoever <laughs> but i was just kidding around because i saw him wearing a neck mask on an in instagram and i was gonna send him the study but i'm just like ah fuck it but it, it was just I, I don't know everything i don't know this there's no hope so i mean at this point i'm, I'm literally doing it just to be funny <laughs> you know <laughs> so, I mean, scientific studies saying what he's wearing doesn't work uh I, I we've reached, we're, we're reaching a point now in our political discussions where it, what what started out is just people trolling other people, like just to try and you know you know just to raise them up, like just to get like somebody who just says something just to rile you up, just to make you angry. Now those people are in charge and they don't know what to do. <laughs> like right. they've, risen, they've risen to this position where like we've just all the rest of us who just kind of give it up and just okay, fine, you lead. Then and they're like, wait, what? No, I'm a tr- I'm just a troll. I don't actually believe any of this stuff. You're gonna hold me to this? <laughs> you can't hold me to this. Well, yeah, I mean, I just for fun, I signed up for the Trump uh, just the notification is to be a donor. I've never obviously don't was it donated to anything he's ever done, but I just wanted to read what he would send. And oh my god, I mean, just the it is like just the other day, Mike Pence made a like a dick joke. When he was talking about red meat, he goes, I got some red meat for you. And then he said this on a campaign trail. (laughs) Yeah, I'll send you the link when we're done. It's real. You can't lie. I mean, he said it. He was claiming that Biden and Harris want to get rid of red meat. And I got some red meat for you. (laughs) And then he went on. And it's, I I don't, I just, the attacks on her just because he picked, I, I don't get it. It's not even as... Like the Ben character, at least there was a strategy behind it. This is just, it's awful. It's terrible. I mean, it's the Trump that he just uses words yeah. like awful and terrible or great and huge. You know, it, there's nothing, no substance to it at all. And it's just depressing. We've stripped away, like, just even the most basic, like, like the basic courtesy <laughs> that used to be. Like, George, w, George H.W. Bush was a monster. He was a monster in many ways. Like he did some monstrous things. He did it because he believed it was the right thing to do for the country, but it was still kind of monstrous what he did. But he would say at the very least, when he was talking to an opponent, he would say, while I respect you, I disagree. And they would have a conversation about it. Right. (laughs) And like, we could we can't even do that anymore we're we're actually like just this the 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 very existence of somebody who is your opponent now just means that you say the most outlandish thing that you could possibly think of saying they're getting rid of red meat 
and and everybody just goes, they are. But then he throws a dick joke on top of it. This is a fucking politician on a campaign trail. And, I mean, I guess it's not new. Four years ago, the same shit was happening, so I can't really... Right. I mean, there's no dignity anymore. It doesn't ex- <laughs> Dignity died years ago. What would be nice, and I guess maybe it's kind of in this movie, but again, they're just saying it, so it doesn't make it true. But if, if you know, racism, you know, homophobia, all this stuff sh- are not politics. You know, that that is something else. But we somehow tied it to politics. And if... I understand the need to argue left and right. There's different versions of it. Like you said, people are willing to let people die for masks. Their their logic is, you know, they're going to die anyway. So who, you know, I, why should my freedom? And okay, I respectfully disagree with you, but whatever. That that is your argument. You can't argue anymore. There's nothing you can do about that person and those people. Yeah. But when you start throwing in the, I mean, there is inherent racism built into all this and homophobia i mean the gay marriage thing is still coming back up and when you can if we can finally strip all that out of politics which i don't know how you do because a lot of it is tied to it but you know at least that would be some sort of progress you know if you get rid of the hate you know to return it to boys state the, if you can find one one minor glimmer of hope, it is that a kid that like Renee, who who's a, a young black man who's kind of got an effeminate uh, uh, manner to him, and he's able to just through charm and and, and char- charisma, able to charm a group of arguably rather conservative uh, male teens into electing him their party chair. That. Uh, that to me is the one little glimmer, right. maybe, of hope in this entire movie. And other than that, I was just, I was just out of it. I was just so depressed. Right. And that's what I was trying to get at. I mean, and they say it a couple of different times, but again, just because you say it doesn't make it true. And yeah. so, you know, if that is where this future is heading, then sh- that is that is a lot of hope, actually, if you can get that out of there. Uh, but then Ben's out there doing racist shit online, pretending that he's not involved in it and maybe he wasn't maybe he was doesn't really matter I, I, I'll never trust the guy <laughs> the kid uh, so it doesn't really freaking matter Oh, he, he was totally behind it was entirely <laughs> he was that little dead eyed monster he absolutely did that yeah oh, I have a radical Oops, idea sorry sorry stop 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 there we go go ahead he's, he's so awful that he's capable of actually telling another human being that they uh, remind him of uh, that this other person reminds him of Ben Shapiro and he means it as a compliment yeah and <laughs> yep. yeah oh no 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 yeah I mean it's available if you want to watch this it. on Apple TV I believe uh, man it's it's a tough one though <laughs> It'll depress yeah. the hell out of you. Maybe you'll see something different than me, though. I'm more than if you want to watch it and hit me up on social media or whatever. I'm interested in hearing someone else's take because I just I tried reading the reviews and I didn't get where they were coming from. Other than maybe the few things we mentioned, and I, maybe those little things are big. I don't know. Maybe we need maybe to take just a little people bit are, are looking for any port in a storm. <laughs> I think more than anything, though, it's Stephen Garza was what we all feel like. Yeah, and because that person exists where there, I think that's what they're looking at, but my God, he's one guy of, out of however many and he lost. So <laughs> I don't know why you call that hope, but whatever. Yeah. Like they totally, the, the horrible person won. like this, this kid was just like, he was Ben's perfect, like foil for being evil. and He won. So there you go. Where's, where's your hope exactly? Right. <laughs> that's the one who won, by the way, is the guy who, who Ben said reminded him of Ben Shapiro. So again, where are you seeing hope here? <laughs> they were trying to play it off like Rocky. Like it didn't matter who won at the end, but it does. I mean, it so does. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe it's maybe their whole point is Texas is getting a little bit better. He barely won. And they're the worst state besides Florida and (laughs) whatever else. So maybe there is hope because every other state's getting even better than them. I I don't know. I'm (laughs) just guessing. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event for the linear, legitimate and universally recognized. Undisputed classic. The Elephant Man. 
The Elephant Man. You know, I used to have nightmares about this movie when I was a little kid, like when I was like five years old and they were showing the commercials for this uh, for like when it was coming to TV or something or home video, I think it was. And they were showing commercials and I was just terrified. And it wasn't even of see, you don't even see him like the Elephant Man, uh, John Hurt in in like uh in the advertising, you just see him in that oversized like mask that he wears over the top, that uh, potato sack or whatever he's got over his face, and and that alone like terrified me for so many years. And I think my mom like made me watch it to try and get me over it. And it, no, I just I was terrified of it as a child, and so I didn't really watch it again until now. And watching it now, this is an incredible movie. What a an amazing work of. Uh, of uh, empathy and sympathy and heart and beauty and tragedy. Uh, the story here is about uh, his his name. His real name is Joseph Merrick, but in, but uh, years ago somebody made them. Uh, it was actually Treves himself, the guy who Anthony Hopkins plays, actually made the mistake in his own bi- autobiography of referring to him as uh, John Merrick, <laughs> and and so that's how he ends up being John Merrick here. Is that David Lynch didn't realize that there had been a mistake <laughs> so many years ago and went ahead and called him John Merrick as well. Uh, so John Merrick was born with uh, essentially just tumors everywhere on his entire body, all over his body, uh, deformed his head and his face and uh, much of his body. Uh, and and uh, that's how he's grown up. And he grows up in a freak show and he's, uh, you know, people just gawk at him and he just uh, kind of treated like he's an animal, like a product. Uh, he, Treves sees him at a freak show and decides to uh, try to help him in some way if he can, or give him some kind of comfort at least. And he takes him to a hospital and cleans him up. And he proves to be this very eloquent, thoughtful, uh, you know, deep young man with a lot of emotion and a lot of soul. And that he becomes a very compelling figure. And John Hurt plays him incredibly well. And just, he's so beautiful and so gentle in his way. And you can't help but feel, you know, deeply, deeply sympathetic for him. Uh, no whining or, or, you know, no, like he doesn't beg for your sympathy. He's just, he's just genuinely sympathetic. And uh, yeah, then you've got Anthony Hopkins who uh, is, is very you know sympathetic in that he's very kind. And yet he's also incredibly self-aware. And that's really the, the interesting and, and unique dynamic that gives this movie kind of an extra sort of David Lynchian charge charge is that uh, as much as this not, you know, like a typically, Lynch movie. It's not as weird as 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 like a typical Lynch movie because he didn't write this. Uh, he was doing a director for hire thing. But uh, the Lynchian aspect of this is almost in the way that in just presenting it because the way the movie implicates you in wanting to stare at at Merrick and you do whether you you can think of yourself as a very good person and assume that you're a very good person who sympathizes with Merrick. But in the end, when <clears throat> when it comes down to that scene where you're finally going to get a good look at him, everybody rises in their seat a little bit and you look a little bit closer and you want to get the best look possible. And that is the movie implicating you in Merrick in, in the whole, you know, the process of the elephant man. Uh, and that is, that is that charge. Uh, the dramatic charge of this movie is that it involves you in a way that is both uh, you know, like deeply engaging on an emotional level, but also like, uh, kind of transgressive in a way and that it's acting upon you and forcing you. If you're going to watch this movie, you're just as bad as everybody else who wants to stare at this guy. And I love that aspect of it. Uh, that whole, you know, the macro aspect of it is just, it's fascinating to me. Uh, and, and I love that. And, and then I love the scene where like, you know, Treves is sitting in a room by himself and his wife comes in and talk to talk to him. And he, and he starts talking about himself. He's like, am I any better than the freak show owner? And, he's not wrong to think that he's like, it's very self-aware of him, you know, cause he, as much as he's kind and giving him friendship and giving him all these great experiences that Merrick genuinely enjoys, he's also parading him in front of, you know, the, the, the princess and, you know, the, the literati, the, you know, actresses and rich people who want to just see the freak and he's letting them do it. And he's accepting money for it. And that, you know, people are supporting the hospital more because he's doing it. And I love, I love everything about this. This is a really great movie. Yeah, I'm with you completely. Uh, it, it's yeah, it, it's hard to explain because you kind of nailed it. it. It is way more straightforward than anything David Lynch has done, but it still has a Lynch feel to it. Like you were saying, it, I mean, it's almost like a 
1950s movies or 1950s movie in a way or even older i don't know it, it doesn't look like it came out in 1980 i mean it looks like an old time classic movie uh it takes its time anthony hopkins is so phenomenal i mean you can see the empathy on his face i mean which yeah uh from the get go and it's just is one of his best roles that he's ever had as far as i'm concerned and you're right it, it you 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 kind of get to live through him and you know ask questions about yourself and you know you're sitting here wondering what can you do for him can you you know you want to help him and you don't want to let him just be a human which i mean it, there's just so much so many questions and there's no real answers there's no right or wrong it's just it it you know you're watching this movie about the elephant man but really it turns it around and makes you watch it about yourself and that's kind of what's really neat about it and from what i understand i mean that's something lynch added to the movie i don't think that was part of the biography that it was based on or whatever uh it's not historically accurate really <laughs> i mean part of it is <laughs> but I, I and i just find that really really neat you know you're watching this movie about quote unquote a freak show and you end up looking at yourself throughout it the whole time. And that's, that's an impressive feat. Very true. Very true. And you know, the legacy of John Merrick is, is so fa Joseph Merrick is so fascinating because it, his, his bones were on display or st may still be uh, on display uh, to this day uh, at, at a London uh, hospital. And he's just his skeleton. Uh, and I, I understand that it's, you know, doctors, are learning from him and they learned a great deal from him uh, in terms of anatomy and, and helping people like him in the future, able to, you know, find ways to medically operate on someone like him safely and, and to relieve the pain of people who have a similar type of uh, affliction at the same time, <laughs> you know, having him on display like this is just more of the, just continuing the freak show and the exploitation because Nobody knows if this was anything he actually ever would want, would have wanted after he died. Nobody ever asked him what he wanted. You know, he's only 21 years old. He was probably not in an emotional, in an emotional place to tell anybody that this is what he would want for the, you know, his legacy. And then you've got, you know, the tab, the, the tablet aspect of him has never gone away. You know, years ago, uh, it was rumored that Michael Jackson has had bought his bones. And then somebody said that uh, Nicholas Cage had bought his bones, <laughs> and I kid you not. I know. Uh, uh, I don't know if that. I don't think either of those things ever happened. I think it's still he's still on display in London, as as I understand it. People aren't allowed to go gawk at it or anything, but except for medical students, right? But it's it's fascinating though the way that it just keeps coming back up and keeps returning to to uh, favor. It keeps re come. It'll come back up again over and over again. Uh, for years to come, just because people find this oddity uh, so fascinating. And uh, we do find physical anomaly to be endlessly fascinating. And it's also about, you know, in, in this day and age where we're, we're coming to understand more about the way we other people and, and what othering is, is just, you know, staring at, at somebody and being unable to identify with them in any way. Like we feel sympathy for John Merrick, but do we truly like see him as a, as just a fellow human being? Like, right. Uh, and that is what othering is all about. It's like looking at a black person and not being able to understand that they're just a person and they're, they're black, <laughs> you know, uh, that is othering. And we're learning more about that. And I think that's what makes, it gives this movie a little bit of an extra, more of that extra charge because it is still so relevant today in the way that we look at somebody who's different from us and we only experience their difference. Yeah, and I saw it for free uh, on. I was on Apple TV. It had commercials, though. I'm trying to think of what app it sent me to. Uh, I'll look it up real quick. Uh, Pluto TV. So it, it is out there to watch if you haven't seen it in a while or have never seen it. It's definitely worth checking out. Uh, I mean, obviously, the commercials interrupting it every five minutes wasn't ideal. <laughs> uh, the same commercial over oh, and over yeah. again. But it, it's still. Uh, it didn't, it, the effect was still there. You know, it wasn't like when we were talking about the movie last week, the, that horror movie, she dies tomorrow, whatever. And I'm, I, I'm dealing with people doing TikToks in the room and that kind of takes me out of the moment. The, the commercials, the AT&T 5G commercial didn't take me out of, uh, 
Elephant Man at all. That everything you're saying rings true for me too. It's, uh, I, I was just fascinating to watch. I'm glad I saw it, and uh, I don't know. Just David Lynch is just uh, he. It makes him that much more confusing. I know it's a director for hire deal, but it's so not like anything else he's done. But elements, I don't know. He's just a weird dude, and this movie I'm- is. I don't know. One of his best. This movie was nominated for eight Academy Awards and did not win one. Uh, It lost to Ordinary People for Best Picture, which is, I mean, you know, I like Ordinary People a little bit. I think it's I think it's solid. I think this is way better. But then Raging Raging Bull Bull also was (laughs) was beaten that year by Ordinary People. So what do we know? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> John Hurt was nominated and lost. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, it's hard to argue who should have got a De Niro. Or I don't know if Hopkins was nominated or not, but he was fantastic in it. He was not. He was not. Wow. Not but, I mean, just the he's the one who draws you into that makes you go into this and start turning the beer on yourself. And I don't know. It, this movie didn't even win for, for makeup, <laughs> which is ridiculous. What one for makeup, Raging Bull? I think so. I mean, Raging Bull's got great makeup, yeah, but come on. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, not, I mean, I went to Wikipedia and looked up Joseph Merrick as well, and I mean, they nailed the makeup. They it did. It's incredible. It's a, it's a remarkable recreation. And, and the way they did that is, is really amazing. Lynch was talking about it in an interview where he had, uh, they actually had access to that skeleton that I was telling you about before. And they actually had a whole bunch of uh, pieces of Joseph Merrick, which is horrible. But they have a, a plaster cast of of Merrick's skull that they made. And they were, they allowed the makeup designer here to actually use that and to, to create the mask that he created, which is uh, which is why it's so uh, amazingly authentic is that right. he was able to actually use Joseph Merrick's own skull essentially to to create to recreate his face. Yeah, I mean, it's so hard for me to know what's right and wrong. You know, part of me like if it were me, and it's so hard to put yourself in that those shoes. You put yourself in Anthony Hopkins' shoes instead. Yeah, uh, but I would like to think I'd be okay with it. But at the same time, am I just justifying? <laughs> Wanting to be okay with you know it's there's so many questions that you don't even get to answer because it's so complicated but it, it's just it, it's a hell of a movie uh, go check it out it's yeah. I mean, all the only thing he wants is to sleep like a normal person <laughs> and, I think uh, you know as much as I, I have a complicated relationship with David Lynch's movies I think because uh, I don't really like lo- I Eraserhead really put me off and yeah uh, I don't I don't love Blue Velvet. Uh, for me, I think this is actually Lynch's best work, uh, and even better than Mulholland Drive. Uh, and maybe that's just the, me being overly conventional. I just prefer kind of this more straightforward idea that has like a, a transgressive David Lynchian charge to it, as opposed to just straight ahead weirdness. Yeah, and I like Eraserhead. I it was just kind of weird for the sake of weird. Uh, I I'll I'll probably go Mulholland Drive. Then this some blue velvet mate. I mean, it's hard to say. I just I really like Mulholland Drive, and I was thinking about this the whole time. And I mean, we we'll go into Wild at Heart. We didn't get to see it, but we can at least talk a little bit about it. Uh, but I, you know, I'm, like I hate Terrence Malick, uh, and <laughs> the and I, I watched Roger Ebert's re- review of Wild at Heart and why he didn't like it, and it was the exact reason why I think I prefer Lynch to Malick. And it was they both do weird. But Malik has a point behind it, and it's such a simple point, and it turns me off. Lynch doesn't always have a point, and if it does, it's like a wet dream or whatever it is, you know. It, it, but because of that, I mean, if you watch Elephant Man, there are shots that could just be paintings, and they don't necessarily add anything to. Them. If anything, that makes the movie a little longer. But it's beautiful to look at, and it means nothing, and or, or really, I mean, it's just really what's in his head. And Blue Velvet, I mean, I watched a lot of the. Uh, director's cut stuff and a lot of the actors had no idea what he was doing like he put stuff under sofas you can't even see in the shot but it just had to be there because he's got a weird head and the unknown of what lynch is doing to me is more appealing than the 
simple idea that Terrence Malick is doing really cool. I mean, they're kind of doing the same thing, just one has a, one has a point behind it, one doesn't. I like the fact that there's no point in a lot of the stuff David Lynch does. <laughs> that said, I hated Eraserhead. So, what do, I mean, I'm a total hypocrite. I'm not going to pretend I'm not. <laughs> but... Uh, let's move on to Wild at Heart because I, I watched a little bit about it. I've seen it years ago on VHS. I don't know if it ever got a what, what release. Like I heard Lynch saying, I don't think it ever came out on Blu-ray. I don't know that for a fact, but I he was saying that in an interview I saw online. The first thing I noticed about it was Nicolas Cage is essentially wearing the same outfit he wore to that Mandy Q and A with Kevin Smith. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was insane. <laughs> oh man, yeah, and like I was looking up stuff about this movie because it's been it's been years. I saw it on HBO, I think, years ago, and that was the only time I've ever been able to to see it. And uh, I remember liking it, or at least remember being you know, like turned on by it. But uh, I don't remember that much about it. But I was watching. I, I decided to watch this 1990 interview with Nicolas Cage that he did with the BBC. That is just absolutely insane he comes leaping out of the out, out of the back room out of the uh, dressing room and just doing karate kicks and like does a he does a cartwheel he then he is uh, like he sits down and he starts starts to talk about <laughs> whatever and he's like hang on a second i meant to give you this t-shirt and uh the guy's like oh you brought me a t-shirt and he's like i'm wearing it hang on he takes off his leather jacket and takes off the shirt and gives it to the guy and puts his leather jacket back Jesus. <laughs> like and he's just he's going a mile a minute it's utterly bizarre and it's like wow i had no idea <laughs> i mean here's when i saw it i i mean nick cage did con air and the rock and Laura Dern and Dun- Jurassic Park, and that's all I really knew going in. I didn't, I didn't watch Twin Peaks. This had come out. This is the first thing he did after Twin Peaks, I believe. And I, knew, I didn't get it. <laughs> you know, this was not the guy from The Rock. This was not the girl from <laughs> Jurassic Park. They were so over the top. There was this Wizard of Oz element to it. I didn't get it. And I so desperately want to watch it in the proper context because I. Th- think i would appreciate it a little more ebert hated it because you know because there's no point and he's a sophisticated moviegoer it drives him nuts and that he goes it's a waste of my time basically what he said so but i love that about it and and then a couple other reviews i read was kind of saying it was more of a parody of the typical go to hollywood become an actor movie but instead you know, in those movies, they never really struggle. Here, all they do is nothing but struggle. Uh, so I don't know. It just, it, I'm fascinated by it. I want to watch it again. It's just, you can't find it anywhere. Yeah, I was, I saw this on HBO, like its initial run, I think 91 or 92, whenever that was. And I was like 15 or 16. And I, I had a vague awareness of who Laura Dern was. And I knew I found her very attractive. And I thought, and I was told, like, this is an R-rated movie where she might be naked. So I was like, I got to watch this. <laughs> and I remember just like, she's like not really naked in the movie. But like, you know, I, but I didn't care after a little while. Like, I was actually really fascinated by how strange it is. And uh, <laughs> See, that was... I look back on it. Look back on it now, and it's like I, I, we actually had in 1990 a movie that's basically like true romance crossed with <laughs> crossed with Elvis and Priscilla crossed with The Wizard of Oz, and like that exists in the world. Yeah, no, that was I kind of had the opposite reaction because, like I said, I knew her from Jurassic Park. Never really thought I'd ever see this act- actress naked. Never even thought about her naked. Just she was a girl <laughs> in Jurassic Park, and she's actually kind of naked in this movie. I mean, not. Like great shots of it because it's not exploitative. It's more, you know, it, it just that was what the scene requires, and it's there. But I was just really shocked. I mean, the whole, the whole character was so nothing like the girl from Jurassic Park <laughs> that I was just really, really shocked and surprised by. But I just I, I want to see it again, and hopefully someday it becomes available. And I can't remember if I had seen Mahalan Drive or not yet. I had to yeah. have known who David Lynch was, but maybe not. Well, the drive was 2000, so. Well, I mean, I again, I was only like 18, 19 then, or so it's not like I was that old. <laughs> and, I mean, The Rock and Con Air, that was the mid-90s, mid to late 90s, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, I think so. So, I mean, I, 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 I think I saw it before then, though. 
uh, before Mulholland Drive, but definitely after Con Air and The Rock. All right, so we talked about Wild of Heart. Let's move on to The Exorcist 3. The Exorcist 3 is uh, uh, with the absolutely, completely brilliant uh, George C. Scott, who uh, is one of the great revelations of this show is watching George C. Scott in movies and realizing that uh, you know, there's there's something I never knew I needed in my life, and that is uh, Brad Dourif and George C. Scott just screaming at each other for 40 <laughs> minutes. Like, that, that is everything I actually needed in my life. I mistook this last week for Exorcist 2, which is I really th- terrible. I thought you did when you said it. I was like, I th- always thought this was pretty good. <laughs> this is amazing. I love this movie. <laughs> and really, all it is is just George C. Scott and Brad Dourif just yelling at each other. <laughs> incredible volumes and George C. Scott just emoting like crazy. Uh, he is just all over the place. I, I am here for it. I love it. I love George C. Scott. He is so awesome. Um, <laughs> he's just, he's, he's so consummate. He is so like, there are so many people who couldn't do a performance like this, where they allow themselves to be so deeply emotionally invested in something that's really could be kind of silly under most contexts. And I just adore his level of, of commitment and just the, the fire and the passion that he brings to it when he and Brad Dourif are just screaming at each other, or even when he just lets Brad Dourif just yell at him over and over again and it's so compelling like it's just two guys in a room but the atmosphere is awesome the the makeup and the lighting and the effects are amazing and it's just bellowing back and forth and i'm feeling like the power of god and the devil in that moment where they're just having this important conversation about uh, about the horrors that the that this man is committing and why he's committing them and why he feels he needs to commit them and i was blown away i was just riveted by those scenes there are other aspects that don't work as much but right. I, I was really i was in it so deeply at that point that i didn't mind the other stuff i i thought this movie was just completely cool and another another revelation of 1990 that ranks right up there with uh, ninja turtles <laughs> just such a funny thing to say uh, <laughs> it's all true but it, it, it just sounds so silly but but it's true <laughs> there's part of me that wishes like Maybe William Friedkin was directing it or something that could tie some of those other silly things together to really make this even better. Uh, but I don't, I, but you're right. It's, and we, you forget, people forget Brad Dorf won an Oscar. I mean, he's a good actor. He just, he's always committed, he's committed to a bunch of silly things like Chucky. And so he, he's kind of forgotten because of that. But he's a hell of an actor too. And you're right. They're, I don't know. I just, this is a pretty good movie. It's really, really uh, go watch this one too. Is on. I watched it for commercials as well on the same app. <laughs> I forgot yeah. the name already. There's a character who early on in the movie, who is uh, Joseph Dyer. He's uh, yeah. he's uh, friends. He's George C. Scott's buddy. They were both friends with father Karras, or at least that's what the dialogue tells us. And, uh, and their banter early on like there's like a lot not a lot happening in terms of like the whole possession or even like there's a couple murders but like uh we don't really see much in terms of like there's not even really a lot of gore in this when you get down to it uh there's a lot of implication but uh the the banter between the two of them is so clever like this is such a great uh bit of writing where there's just they they paint this entire history of these two characters so well they feel like you feel like these guys have known each other forever and we're watching them talk you know the the friendliest shorthand imaginable where they they know everything about each other and so much of it can go unspoken and uh it's so familiar and i loved that well, it was directed by the writer, <laughs> so that's yeah. probably, but I mean, it comes down to the performances, and uh, I mean, George C. Scott has been. Uh, I mean, this you're right. This podcast has really brought him out. I, I've always known him as Patton, and that was it. But he's so much more than that, and everything we've seen him do. Just a few weeks ago with that Jimmy Stewart movie, him and the two of them next to each other, op- op- acting opposite each other was fantastic. And then again here, I, he really is. Uh, quietly too because we even that we still don't talk about him like we do jimmy stewart or but i mean he's done it quietly but it's not in this one he's very loud but uh i don't know it is it's been fun to watch and fun to discover and it was really cool to kind of be shocked by this because i remember vaguely liking it but i don't remember if i ever saw it 
you know, watching it again, I don't remember anything in it. So maybe I just read that it was good. And, uh, but I, this, it was such a good experience. And in some ways it's scarier than the exorcist. I don't like that. It's tied to it. Really. That's the only thing I would change. If I had to change anything, but I don't know. It's, I enjoyed watching it and I think people should give it a shot. I didn't mind the connection. I mean, I, I think this is better than The Exorcist. I know people don't like when I, when I say that, but I'm not a fan of the original Exorcist movie. Uh, I find that film to be to be cheap and exploitative, but I, I like I like this one a lot more. And I think I, I didn't mind the connection to the first one because I liked what they did with Karis here. I liked what they did yeah, using true. that. His his using his body and using that against uh, against George C. Scott's character. Granted, it's it's total invention and and it's a you know it's kind of a convenient invention to have him you know just say that he was connected to Father Karras and we have no actual proof of that. But you know how else are you going to make it work? I, I get it. You have to make well, some no, compromises. No, I get it. I'm just, he could I, just... I thought that was just that that revelation. That look on George C. Scott's face when he looks in that room, and instead of seeing Brad Dourif, he sees Father Karras. And that's and we're told that that's all he sees. He never sees Brad Dourif. He sees Father Karras because uh, Brad Dourif, the Gemini killer, right. uh, is is inhabiting his his body. And uh, I thought that was a, a really clever and actually really well done. I mean, you could fuck that up really badly. Uh, you know, you could confuse a lot of audiences, which I'm sure there are plenty of people who came away confused as to what they were seeing. But I, I thought he handled that incredibly well. The way he shifted between those two personas, I was really impressed by that. And I thought that that little extra dramatic charge it gave that that you know he was using this familiar face and this familiar body, and really just the, the way he fucked with with George C. Scott's head over that uh, Gemini killer was really really smart. That's true. I mean, I guess more what I mean is it's totally a totally different movie. Yeah, this well, is almost this is kind a, of a, this is a, like a murder mystery instead of a possession movie. <laughs> and even the, I mean, the Exorcist plays more like a straight ahead drama, which just at the end gets crazy. Because I think one of your complaints about the Exorcist is like two hours go by before it even starts to get scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't know. Yeah, it, it is. It, it is a really good movie. It is more. It's definitely more up the horror alley than there's a lot. It's not as gory. I mean, there's a gory scene at the end where he gets peeled to the ceiling and falls off. That's pretty <laughs> gross. But otherwise it is a lot of implied, but it's scarier from the get go, I guess. Kind of. I well, don't know. The, 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 the descriptions, the way that George C. Right. Scott describes what happened. Is, he's just that good. Like he describes a character having his head cut off and like replaced with a statue and it's and it's scarier than actually when we actually get to see it uh, yeah and uh, how the person was could feel everything that was happening to him yeah that was such a great detail yeah oh, i love that that was just terrifying and so well done and yeah i mean yeah like you said great revelation the some ninja turtles uh <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it's on Apple, I saw it on Apple TV. I think it moved me to the Pluto app as well, but it's available if you want to watch it. I definitely recommend heading back. And I don't know if we want to talk about taking care of business or my blue heaven. That's up to you. <laughs> uh, taking care of business is, of course, the uh, one of the greatest movies ever made because the Cubs win the World Series in it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's all I remember about uh, it. <laughs> It's the only thing anybody should remember about it, but thankfully we don't have to remember this movie anymore because the Cubs have actually won a World Series, so now we can forget this movie ever happened. Because uh, <laughs> for a long time in my life, uh, 26 years, uh, uh, 25 years, however long it was, this was the only time I'd ever seen the Cubs win a World Series, and so I cherished that feeling, <laughs> even if it was imagined. I mean, Back to the uh, Future 2 referenced it. You don't see it, but they do They lost it. that World Series. Oh, they lost it? They lost. Miami beat Chicago. Oh, I thought they won it. And, uh, never yeah, mind. Miami then. beat Chicago. I think is what it said. Uh, but no, this is the one time where where we get to see like Mark Grace hit a home run and the Cubs win the World Series. Like it's implied that that whole 1990 team, like you know, Jerome Walton and Dwight Smith and uh, Sandberg and Grace, are all playing in the World Series. Steve Buscell, like <laughs> so good in '89. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the team. implication that they're playing in a World Series and Grace hits a game winner, and that was a that was a lo long cherished memory for me, even if this is a a G Jim Belushi movie. Yeah, 
And then I my, prefer to think of this as a Charles Grodin movie. <laughs> I prefer to think of this as a BTO song. <laughs> uh, and then My Blue Heaven, I, Steve Martin, Rick Moranis. I got nothing for that one either. <laughs> uh, Steve Martin, uh, it is his birthday this weekend. He's 76 years old. Uh, this movie came out 30 years ago this weekend. He plays a gangster who goes into uh, uh, witness protection. Uh, he gets sent to this small town in California, and he begins setting up criminal businesses behind the back of his FBI handler, played by Rick Moranis. And he, you know, it's a p- typical fish out of water comedy where, uh, you know, he's the wild party starter who's kind of bringing Rick Moranis out of his shell, and he helps meet a woman and and fall in love, and uh, he also helps the kids build a baseball field, and it's it's not terrible. It's kind of clever. Uh, Steve Martin's really over the top and, and obnoxious and that can get kind of tiresome, but it's not bad. Well, that's good. All right. Next week, Michael Carlson is going to join us. Uh, we've got a bunch of 1990 movies, pump up the volume, dark man, Delta force Two. He specifically requested to be on for men at work. The Charlie Sheen, Emilio Estevez movie. They've made a lot of movies this year already. <laughs> I'm really <laughs> kind of wondering <laughs> where they had time to make all these uh, and they're all kind of Navy SEALs over and over again. So, well, I, now, pump up the volume is the reason why I'm in radio. Yeah, I, I remember you saying that once. So I'm curious. That'll be a fun add-on to the show. And right now we have Talk Radio penciled, penciled in as the classic. Uh, and the new movie, I think, is Tesla. There might be some others that pop up as well. But that's what we're going to do for next week. I know Michael has a new podcast. I think it's, I can't remember the name of it. So I'll ask him next week and let him promote <laughs> it a little bit. Uh, but that'll be fun. I haven't uh, seen him still in a long movies time. or? I believe, I believe it is. I've listened to it too. Like, why can't I not remember the name of the movie, the podcast? Because uh, the, pr- the pressure is on. Right. Because <laughs> I don't have it in front of me and I forgot I was going to talk about it. And I mean, he, he's been always kind of a pop culture guy, especially from that 80s early 90s era so uh it'll be he'll be fun we'll talk to him about it next week uh but he's always an entertaining guest to have on so i'm looking forward to that and otherwise we can do a little bit of flick chart if you have time sounds good uh signs or ghostwriter signs the commitments 1991 or rushmore Rushmore. Agreed. 21 Jump Street, Reign of Fire. 21 Jump Street. Yes. That Thing You Do, Ratatouille. That Thing You Do, actually. I love Ratatouille, but uh, That Thing You Do. I agree with you. (laughs) This is fun. Die Hard 2 or The Happening? Oh, Oh, man. I hate Die Hard 2, but it's better than The Happening. Yeah, I'm with you. Batman, 1989, Crocodile Dundee 2. Batman. 100%. Look Who's Talking to, coming out later in 1990. And Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. Lemony Snicket. The Manchurian Candidate, 2004. Or The Spy Who Loved Me. Manchurian Candidate. You just refuse to vote for Bond movies. <laughs> I do. I hate Bond. The People versus Larry Flint or Magnolia? Uh, Magnolia. Let's go to The People versus Larry Flint. I won one. I don't know if that's <laughs> a bad thing or not. Uh, platoon about a boy. About a boy. I'm going to flip again. I feel bad doing that because I'm supposed to like about a boy more. Well, it won, so you win. <laughs> <laughs> the X Files Walk the Line. X Files. I'll flip one more time. I don't hate Walk the Line. I just think it's overrated. I don't hate it either, but I have no passion for it, and I kind of enjoy the X Files. Well, you win. I have no passion for either, but I have less passion for the X Files. <laughs> Uh, the Damned United, two thousand nine. Wishmaster, nineteen ninety seven. I don't know either one of these. Movies. I'll just go. Yeah, let's just go two different movies. Lincoln, Toy Story. Toy Story, because I, I really have no passion to watch Lincoln ever again. It was fine. It was good. 
Agreed. A time to kill shooter. A time to kill because shooter's a real piece of shit. Yep. Crazy stupid love shaft. Crazy stupid love. I mean, what? what wait, are we talking about the original shaft? No, sorry. We're okay. talking about the, the, yeah. the remake. Uh, Beverly Hills Cop 2 Network. Network. Yes. 500 Days of Summer, Zach and Mary make a porno. Ooh, tough one. Uh, Zach and Mary. I, would, I was going to go with you either way, but I truly I like Zach and Mary better, but I appreciate 500 Days of Summer. Yeah, I love 500 Days. It's just a little sadder, and I've, I've seen Zack and Mary a lot. And I'll keep watching Zack and Mary for the rest of my life. You know, <laughs> there's a documentary behind the making of uh, Jay and Silent Bob Reboot on Amazon right now for free. <laughs> oh, yeah? Cool. Yeah. Uh, I started watching that until my wife walked in the room. Uh, Star <laughs> Trek Three: The Search for Spock, The Birdcage. Ugh. Ugh. God. <laughs> Oh my god! No, no, I can't. I can't vote for the birdcage. That is that, that is too much of a horror show. So, I even I hate Star Trek, but I'll go Star Trek. Was the birdcage considered good when it came out? I think so. It was like it was a bit of a blockbuster, if I recall correctly. But it's just, I mean, Hank, if you think Hank Azaria is offensive as a poo, <laughs> this is even way more offensive. <laughs> Batman Forever, American Wedding. <laughs> American Wedding. I agree. Basic Instinct, Kingman, the Secret Service. Kingsman. I'll take your word for it. I haven't seen it. <laughs> Rise of the Planet of the Apes, 2011. Why the hell is a George Carlin stand-up special? All right, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, American <laughs> Pie 2. <laughs> Rise of the Planet of the Apes. All right. Men in Black 3, 30 Days of Night. Um, uh, both those aren't very good, are they? Uh, 30 days of night. Yeah, at least that was a somewhat original idea. Yeah. Not horribly executed well, but, or not executed well, but not horribly either. Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, Double Jeopardy. <laughs> Double Jeopardy. Yeah. U571, Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. <laughs> U571. Maybe there's another one coming. Uh, <laughs> Bolt, Live Free or Die Hard. Oh, God. Ugh, what? Uh, Was Live uh, Free or Die Hard Part 4? I don't even remember which one it is. I didn't hate the first PG-13 one. I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it like I thought I was going to. But He's flying like a stupid Harrier jet on the ground or something. It's like really... Wasn't that the next one? Timothy Oliphant. Was it? I have no I idea. I honestly couldn't tell you which movie this is. I'm going to go with Bolt. 